thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the seven times I do the welcome, right, for this event. Right. So again, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. So before we start, I wish to acknowledge that our tonight's event is held on the traditional lands of the Nyungur people. I would like to start by welcoming so many people who are kindly here with us today. Obviously, the firstly, our keynote speaker, Professor Nikos Bosjonels from M. Lyon Business School in French. Right. Welcome, Nick. Uh, Jan Norberger. Right, General Manager for Education and Training at Education Australian Medical Association WA. Welcome, Jan. And as Jamie mentioned last but not least, my close colleagues, Professor Stephen Teo, Professor Research Fellow, Associate in Management and Director of Center for Work and Performance in the School of Business and Law at ECU. So basically, School of Business is, uh, Law is, at ECU is Stephen Teo. <laughs> I would like to also thank and welcome our Distinguished guests, Denise McComish, partner at KPMG, right, Cohen Grogan, the managing director of Yapi Group. I would like to thank and welcome right, the two gentlemen over there, our senior DVC at ECU, Professor Arshad Omari, our HR director, Jenny Robertson, and Professor Ari Mariam Omari, our executive dean of the School of Business and Law. And surely welcome so many friends, colleagues, and guests that unfortunately I can't mention here one by one. Thank you all for coming. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our seventh ECU Business Flash Light today. I have noticed that there are many regular participants of this forum in this room, which is very pleasing. For those who have joined us tonight, as a brief background, ECU Business Flash Light is a regular forum organized by the School of Business and Law at ECU for our academic researchers to engage in a collaborative dialogue with industry and government on issues in business and management. This is our third year in delivering this series of forum, and we are pleased that we have had many distinguished speakers from Australia and overseas, including government ministers, prominent scholars, and industry leaders previously. Today's forum has a very interesting topic, how to build a high-performance culture in organization. Very relevant, very important topic in today's management of the workforce, obviously. So I believe this will be an exciting forum tonight. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Mariam Omari, Executive Dean of ECU Schools of Business and Law, to the podium to formally open the event. Please, Mariam, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I won't be up here very long. Um, I just want to thank Hadrian again, as I do each time we have one of these events, because this event is his brainchild. It was all about bringing together our research and our academics together with industry, because what we do needs to have applicability in the workplace. So the mission for our School of Business and Law is about producing industry-ready graduates, quality teaching and learning, and applied engaged research, which is what this forum is about. Um, thank you to those of you who are here, um, members of our advisory board, um, especially we just had that advisory board meeting, so thank you for that. Um, our industry partners, professional associations, and also colleagues um, from the university. So thank you for your time. Uh, great pleasure to have our three speakers. Um, Nick, who's come a long way and is enjoying our supposed winter. <laughs> he lived in the UK for a very long time. He said this is like the European summer. Um, Jan, who's a great friend of ECU and SBL, and we're doing some very exciting things with Australian Medical Association and the School of Business and Law to come and our own professor of happiness, as we call him, um, Stephen Teo. So um, I'm going to introduce Nick very quickly and hand over to the main, main event. Um, so Nick is a professor of organization, behavior, and international HRM in EM Lyon Business School, France. But we're very happy to have him as an adjunct professor with the School of Business and Law as well. Um, he's been presenting to our research higher degree students and to our academic staff in the last couple of days. And really, it's been an absolute pleasure to have him with us. And the feedback has been amazing. Uh, for somebody, at, and, and he's very humble because he keeps saying, oh, I'm just a normal academic. He's actually a guru in the careers field internationally. So um, really, it is a great pleasure to have him here. Um, Nick's research focuses on careers, high performance work systems, and individual differences in the workplace. He serves as edi uh, senior editor of the Asia Pacific Journal of H uh, Management, an ABDCA ranked journal, and has published around 200 journal articles and conference papers. 
His research has attracted nearly 4,000 academic citations and has repeatedly attracted the interest of international media and specialist press, such as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNN, the BBC, the New York Post, the Boston Globe, running out of breath, the Times, <laughs> Forbes, L'Express, West France, Davos Economic Forum, and the list goes on. Um, he has extensive experience in teaching and development in countries uh, such as the United Kingdom, where he um, studied and worked for many years in France, where he's been at a number of top quality institutions, uh, USA, China, Germany, Norway, Greece, again, the list goes on, Romania, Serbia, the United Arab Emirates, Singapore. You can add Australia to the list now. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so let's go through the mechanics. Right, okay, it works. Right, thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to thank uh, Edith Cowan University for inviting me here and uh, uh, all the senior people, including uh, Mariam and Stephen and Hadrian, etc., for being very hospitable with me. Um, just to give you, uh, I'll try to keep, uh, uh, not I'll try, I have to to keep within the time limit. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of my background, originally I'm Greek. Uh, I was adopted by the United Kingdom years ago. Uh, so I'm also British, but 40% British. Uh, I've spent most of my career in the UK, in, mostly in two places, Strathclyde Business School and Durham University. And recently, five years ago, we moved to France. Uh, so our son is a French, because he was born there, my son is French with a British nationality, this is what we say. Uh, so just to give you a bit of the background, my initial training was in mathematics, but then I moved into psychology and management. Um, so what we're going to talk about uh, here a little bit, uh, and it's about high performance work systems and careers, especially uh, what I see as uh, sustainable careers, because careers have to be sustainable, otherwise we have many issues with the society uh, and the economy. Um, and uh, the view I'm taking, maybe Mariam didn't tell you that, but uh, the, the doctoral students and the staff saw it. I'm a little bit extreme, not very extreme, but a little bit polarized. So it's going to be a bit the same here. Um, so. Uh, uh, another uh, call, can you hear me yeah. correctly? I hope you understand me. I hope you understand my accent. So um, we're going to talk about a concept which is called high performance goal systems. I'm not sure how much familiar you are with it. It's a, it's a relatively new concept that came out uh, uh, less than around 20 years ago. That was a seminal book. Um, and basically, it's, it's a kind of highly hyped idea. Uh, you will see it with many different uh, uh, terms, high commitment, high involvement work systems or work practices. It is exactly the same. Um, as it happens normally with academics, is that we don't exactly know what we are talking about. So we come with a particular concept, but it is not clear how to operationalize it. So basically, it's a highly hyped idea, uh, but it is a unclear, at least to me, uh, as I told you, I'm just a mediocre academic, so many other, maybe other academics understand it, but I, I cannot. So basically, it is unclear what exactly it represents. I mean. There are a number of possibilities. Uh, if you read the literature, um, this question arises. Uh, first of all, uh, one possibility, and this is how it has been defined sometimes, it is whether a firm utilizes state-of-the-art methods in the management of this workforce. State-of-the-art methods would be, for example, using, as we call it, the, the structured interview for selection, or using um, um, a results oriented appraisal, etc. This is state of the art method. Uh, another possibility, however, could be whether a firm aligns its HR, human resource systems, with its business strategy. It has also been stated that it is this. Uh, and another possibility is that whether the HR strategy of a firm reflects the so called stabilization model. 
and we'll see what is the stabilization model of HR strategy. Uh, in fact, originally, the original writings uh, reflected this. So what, what of this is, uh, what is, uh, is it? And what are the implications of this, for example, for uh, careers uh, and then for a stable society and a stable economy? Now, a little bit of theory, I apologize about that. Um, uh, the capture versus stabilization human resource strategy. Um, the, maybe some of you, or probably many of you, uh, have heard of Porter and Porter's model of business strategy, which is a simplistic model, but we teach because it enables us to use a particular framework. So basically, what Porter says, Porter says that uh, essentially we can have, we, co we can compete in two different ways. One is, this is the business strategy, we can have two, two competitive strategies. One could be on cost. So I compete in cost. I sell things cheaper than my competitors. And this can be from widgets that people use to uh, airplane tickets. Absolutely anything, but I compete on cost. People buy it because it is cheaper. And the other possibility is differentiation. What is differentiation? Differentiation means I offer something which is unique. It is perceived as better, more aesthetic, more beautiful. I can do my work better. Uh, the prime example here, of course, is Apple. Uh, they complete clearly on differentiation. So these are the two, roughly the two business strategies. Of course, you can be a little bit in between, but according to Porter, this is how we are in terms of strategy. Now, HR comes and says, now, what is the best HR strategy to feel, to fit into those two business strategies? For example, if I compete on cost, what sh should I do? To give you an example again, McDonald's competes mostly on cost. What kind of strategy, HR strategy, should I have to be able to sell cheap, but at the same time to be quite well organized, etc.? And this is the so-called capture human resource strategy. What is the capture human resource strategy? Just think about McDonald's or a very low cost airline. Basically what we have is that we offer people a job, not much security, uh, no many strings attached, no many promises about career for the future, uh, and it's a kind of, as we call it, a transactional psychological contract. That's a transaction. I do something for you, you pay me, the end of the day, that's it. Maybe the relationship can go on, but there is absolutely no promise. That's the capture model. Uh, the, there isn't much training, there isn't much investment into the employees in the capture model. That's why it's called capture. Now, the differentiation model, sorry, the stabilization uh, strategy which is supposed to fit a differentiation business strategy is a bit different. Not a bit, quite different. Means that actually we see the relationship with the employees in the long term. We invest in them, uh, we train them, we develop them, we make them better, we offer them internal career opportunities. Um, and this is basically the idea. This is the stabilization. HR strategy. And the idea in theory, the theory, doesn't mean that the theory is correct, is that normally the best way to compete with cost is to have a, a capture strategy. The best way to compete to, in terms of differentiation, you need to have a stabilization culture because it's difficult, for example, to be producing, I don't know, uh, to be designing the next generation of iPhones uh, or to come with something so original and uh, rely on part-timers. It's very, very difficult. So this is the idea. Again, this is just the theory. It doesn't mean the theory is always correct. Now, these are just some statistical indicators for its approach, which I have just said. Here we have pretty much uh, everything is uh, longer stay of people, higher average age, more uh, investment into the employees. Here, of course, is pretty much the other way. Um, and, of course, normally we have another concept in HR, which is flexibility. Normally, when we have a capture strategy, we tend to have numerical flexibility. For example, if the season is not very good, if we don't have much business in the season, we just lay off some people. 
Or what we do is that we offer people less part-time hours. Pretty simple. So we have numerical flexibility or external flexibility. It means that if we have a lot of business, we hire some more people. If not, we just lay these people off. Functional or internal flexibility means that I have well-trained, very committed people that when I need them to work harder, they will stay longer and they will work harder. Or when I need to develop a particular area and I don't have too much expertise, these people are well-trained to be able to adapt and to work on that area. That's basically the idea here uh, of um, uh, capture and stabilization. So I, I, I believe it is pretty clear what each of these model is. Now, uh, to go back to high performance work systems, we have more than 70, we have identified more than 70 HR practices around. So again, academics come with many, a lot of ideas, but it's difficult to understand what is uh, exactly what the practices of high performance work systems are. Um, some people, some of these practices actually are contradictory. So it seems that the best idea, as initially described uh, in the initial reading, high performance work systems ca can be seen as operating the so-called Southwest Airlines model. What is the Southwest Airlines model? It is basically a stabilization, high stabilization model. It is remarkable because it came out in the United States, where, as you probably know, in the United States, employment is at will, which means that companies can fire people at any time without any issue. Nevertheless, it came out from the United States, from Herb Kelleher. You might have heard of him. Uh, by many people, is considered one of the top 50 CEOs of the 20th century. Uh, and basically, the model of Southwest is what? Uh, is highly stabilization. And the idea is what? We have three HR subsystems. People flow as people go through the organization, performance appraisal, and employment relations. And what is happening? We have staffing. We select people for our culture. For Southwest goes team players. Extensive training. Broad career paths, many possibilities, <coughs> internal promotion opportunities, and job security. Herb Kelleher had never, they had never made layoffs, even in difficult times, and he said, nothing kills your culture more than layoffs. So basically, they have a strict non-layoff policy. Um, people flow, basically, is we're focused with the appraisal, and we have extensive and open-ended rewards. Such rewards can be, for example, um, the company culture. Um, and employment relations uh, is basically uh, Southwest was based a lot, relied a lot on participation. They recognized pretty much around 90% of employees were members of the union. Um, so there was very close collaboration with the unions. They had broad job descriptions. What would happen, for example, if when the, the plane had landed, uh, even the pilot, if there was some work to be done um, uh, in the cabin, the pilot would do that, would help. So it was broad job descriptions. It was they were working uh, not within a team, as they say, but as a team. Um, that's the idea of Southwestern Lines. Now, um, the idea here is with this strategy, HR strategy, we are able not only to compete in differentiation, but we are also able to compete in low cost. Southwest Airlines were offering the cheapest uh, tickets. Uh, they had the lowest cost per seat in the industry. Nevertheless, they operated, they were operating with a stabilization strategy. So the stabilization strategy can operate in both, despite the theory, either in cost or in differentiation. But also we have examples in France, Leroy, Leroy Merlin, as the French call it, is basically something like b &Q we have in England. Um, about home uh, DIY, or free mobile is also um, a, f a dominant now uh, company which offers uh, network services in France. They have extremely cheap products, but apparently they operate a stabilization strategy. They have qualified people they take care of, but they are still able to, be, to, um, to operate in cost. Uh, the reverse, apparently, however, is not possible. 
The reverse is probably not possible. It is very difficult to imagine that we have uh, a capture strategy working with part-timers, seasonal workers, not investing in people, and competing in quality. It's very, very difficult. Um, now, however, if we see high-performance work systems are simply aligned of HR with business strategy, we may also have another model, which is the Ryanair model. Maybe you have heard of Ryanair. It's a very successful company, uh, if you see it in terms of shareholder value, etc. And what is the Ryanair model? The Ryanair model is pretty much exactly the opposite from the Southwest Airlines model. Um, basically, it's ex pretty much exactly the opposite. Um, Excessive utilization of subcontracting, there are only very few core employees. Even the pilots are not officially working for, uh, for Ryanair. Uh, they are self-employed. They have to pay for their own uniforms. They have to pay for their own training. Uh, employees are essentially freelancers. Minimal training, minimal training. Uh, ex extremely limited career opportunities internally, and of course, job insecurity. Uh, the CEO has said it explicitly, we thrive on job insecurity. Uh, appraisal and rewards, maybe there is this, but the rewards are limited, very limited, and strictly, very strictly defined. The pay is very, very low of people, plus they have to pay for their own expenses, they have to book their own hotels, etc. And employment relations, basically strict job descriptions and complete discouragement, the spies of unions. Very polemic with the unions. Um, and basically, however, this is how they operate, uh, but they are successful. They are doing very, very well. Um, so the idea again here is we have a high performance work system and it matches the business strategy, which is cost. Um, so the point is which one we have to prefer, how we, we have to go. Um, and now we have the point, the issue of the sustainable career. What is a sustainable career? It's a new idea. The sustainable career basically means that we are able to balance the benefits for firms, individuals, and the society uh, with sustainable careers, by offering sustainable careers. So what are sustainable careers? Basically, there are five points. First of all, people learn. They learn continuously in order to be employable. Second, they have job security. Third, we match competencies and interests with the work the individual performs. So the person really finds the work interesting and we experience what we call flow. Uh, that is our abilities and interests match the work. We have work-life balance or reinforcement, even better. And we have physical and psychological health. Now, this is sustainable careers. It appears that it is only the Southwestern lines or strictly stabilization model that can promote sustainable careers. Um, to illustrate, first of all, we know there's a lot of research which shows that employment insecurity increases physical and psychological sickness, including workplace accidents. Actually, I can describe it, we don't have time, there is in fact a loop. The more insecurity, the more people show off sick for work, the more likely to have an accident, the more likely not to report the accident, the more likely to go on sick leave again. So basically, it's a vicious cycle. Lack of training, of course, does not promote learning, and by extension, doesn't promote employability and performance. And of course, uncertainty makes work-life balance very, very difficult. And now, in addition, of course, low wages, limited learning and development, lack of prospects, and employment insecurity, this is my idea. This is what I believe. Uh, not everybody believes that, but some people believe it, including me. This arguably destabilizes the society and probably the economy in the long term. And I'm able to bring arguments. It is something contestable, but I believe this is the case. And therefore, the idea is that uh, in order to be able to take care of all stakeholders, which is, of course, firms, employers, uh, uh, but also uh, the society and the individuals and people, 
in order to take care of all stakeholders, we have to look at uh, high performance uh, in terms of the southwestern line model, because this is the only way to sustain, to have sustainable careers, which preserves the interest of every stakeholder. Every stakeholder. Um, such a strategy to use a stabilization or the southwest strategy is more painful, for sure. It's more painful. Um, many times uh, CEOs can be tempted when, for example, sales are low, etc., can be tempted to do redundancies. Nevertheless. It is a painful model, but nevertheless, it is the model that gives us the best interest. And probably we know that normally, in order to achieve something, we have to have to endure a little bit of pain. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad I managed to be on time, probably. <laughs> so, thank you. So like Nick was saying, you know, he's very extreme and he tends to have very extreme views. Um, I don't have extreme views. I'm a very um, positivist. I only have one view, you know, whatever my American colleagues tell me works, it works. <laughs> no, it's a joke. I'm, I'm, I'm glad Sue is laughing. That's great. So anyway, so, you know, I was thinking about what Nick is presenting today and, uh, you know, I thought, how can I, um, you know, compliment what he does and uh, actually have something intellectual to say? Then I thought, you know, look, I'm always on the bright side. Um, some people call me Professor of Happiness. You know, as you can tell, I'm very cheerful. So I thought I'll just present something that's on the dark side. So it's called Bias Beware. You know, don't just jump into high performance, Jenny. And uh, there's something bad that's happening. Sorry, I'm talking to my HR director here. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a joke. Yeah, she's going to pick on me later. <laughs> so anyway, so today's topic is on bias beware. Uh, it's, all, it's not all bright and shiny about high performance work system. It's not just about sustainable career. There's actually something more sinister behind that whole concept of uh, high performance. Um, another good thing about being local, being a host to a guest, is that I can choose to be the second presenter. <laughs> so that means I don't have to define the concept because Nick has done all that for me. So there you go. So bias beware. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to skip over a lot of um, definitions. So we're going to look at high performance work system and the service work. Uh, obviously academics, we are service work, but up today we are not looking at uh, academic. We are looking at employees in the visitor economy. So we're looking at hospitality workers. And uh, we're going to look at high performance work system and part-time nurses. Uh, as you all know, in the gig economy, a lot of our workers uh, tend to uh, work casual, work part-time. So uh, my study is uh, you know, focusing on that particular group of employees, uh, service employees and nurses who are part-time workers, and look at the impact of high performance on nursing engagement and well-being. So um, high performance work system, as Nick was saying, there's you know, thousands of uh, definitions on what it is and what it's not. And uh, some people call it high commitments, others call it high involvement. Um, so it's been um, you know, basically studied in terms of um, if organizations implement more high performance oriented HR practices, the end result is uh, employee engagement because uh, employees, uh, they feel that they are committed, uh, organizations care for them so there's a sustainable career once they see all that benefits then um, their energy level uh, what they call you know in, in terms of uh, the positive psychology uh, their energy level is going to go up so they'll feel more vigorous they at work they have a positive energy and they're more likely to want to commit so that's what leads to a high performance um, one of the recent articles in that whole area of high performance work system was by by um, uh, Jiang and his colleagues from uh, uh, America, 
um, what they did was uh, they did this wonderful study, um, Ashad, there's no numbers. Uh, so he was asking me, any stats? I said, no stats. I've, I've gone to a new new site. No more stats now. Just give you diagrams. Um, so Chiang et al, they did a meta-analysis. So what meta-analysis did was basically they, w they went out to the literature, they collected all the publications that have statistics, and they uh, you know, look at the correlations between all the different uh, uh, studies and looking at what they call effect sizes of uh, different bivariate relationships. Oh, that sounds so deep and meaningful, isn't it? And uh, they actually proved that. They, they, they have approved over 150 plus articles and, and published work where they say that uh, if organizations were to adopt more ability enhancing HR, that means more training, uh, more uh, emphasizing on uh, that whole idea of uh, giving you skills to allow you to perform in your job, and uh, motivation enhancing, giving you a career path, giving you a performance appraisal, giving you the pay that uh, tells you that you are value in your organization, and opportunity uh, HR practices, that means career path and so on, that is going to lead to high performance uh, uh, workplace because you feel more committed, you're more satisfied with your job, therefore you know, you're engaged and your organization's performance as a result will go up. So that's a good side, you know, where I say I'm following my American colleagues where, you know, I say, yes, 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 high performance is the way to go. Let's all do high performance. So I thought, you know, Maybe there's something more sinister out there. You know, maybe there is a dark side. So this is my presentation. I want to show you that possibly there might be some dark side to high performance in Australia. Not sure about America. So now we're going from USA to Australia and, uh, and, and look at that, that whole idea of uh, dark side. So this study that I'm presenting right now has yet to be published. Uh, it's together with my postdoc who's hiding in the back, keeping time. Uh, so the aim of the study was to look at the effect of high performance work system in enhancing work engagement and burnout. Okay, so that's the dark side coming in. Because we all know that high performance is good, high performance is going to lead to work engagement. But if you look at uh, Nick's presentation earlier, if you were to adopt the Ryan A model, you know, you're going to feel that you're less uh, engaged with your job because you have to pay for your own hotel. God, I'm not going to go to conferences if I'm going to pay for my own hotel and pay for my own uniform in order to come into work. Oh, sorry, I wear jeans to work. So, okay. I've already paid for my own uniform anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Um, so, so, in that sense, um, you know, so we already know that there's a potentially a dark side to this whole idea of high performance. And the theory that I'm using in this study is um, the job demands resources model. So, what the job demands resources model of uh, job stress uh, is actually saying that uh, as employees experience more workload, or work intensification, lack of job autonomy, that means you don't have any decision making over how you do your job, you don't have the skills to do your job, you don't have any, uh, oh, spelling error, there's another one there, sorry, English as second language, can't spell. <laughs> um, you know, as they experience poor management of change, um, then they'll feel you know, an intensification of their job demands. Uh, at the same time, if they don't have the skills, they don't have discretion, uh, if they do have all those things, then they are more likely to be more engaged. So job demand and job resources, according to the theory, have opposite relationship with engagement. Uh, but however, they also impact on each other. You can see that if your demands goes up, then most likely you need to have more resources in order to, uh, to uh, meet that demand. So uh, uh, obviously one of the variables of interest here is work engagement. So what is work engagement? So it's a persistent, positive and sat satisfying state of mind. So I'm saying that's a happiness coming in here. You know, it's an effective motivational state of work-related well-being, related to work that's not directed towards any particular event, object or person. So that's a positive energy that this particular field of research is suggesting if you have more job demand, you have less work engagement. You have more job resources, you have more uh, work engagement. I think Sam publishes something on job demand, didn't you? And job stress recently. 
Yeah. Stress. Yeah. So there you go. So you can see the relevance of what I'm doing with some of Sam's research. Sam is a professor of tourism. So um, yeah, one of our gurus uh, in in ECU. So uh, basically, the study is no no maths, no stats. It's just only diagrams. So what we're trying to say here is, um, if you have high performance work system, it's more likely that. Uh, is that a positive? I think I put the wrong thing. Uh, high performance is going to give you more, more job demand because you can see that if your dean comes and tells you you have to publish more, you have to give us more research income, sorry, the two deans there, you're most likely you're going to feel that it's a work intensification. So the job demand will go up. On the other hand, if the DVC at the back, senior DVC there saying, and the HR director say, you know, look, but we'll support you. We give you more training. So that's what we call job resources. So all those things are good because they're going to give you more engagement. As a result, you are expected to have less burn out. Okay, so that's the dark side of uh, high performance. So what did I find? So I went out to 600 nurses from Australia. They are all uh, part-time nurses. They are not full-time, who completed our survey. There's 508 females. Obviously, it's a very uh, uh, female occupation. Uh, they have um, greater than 10 years of work experience, 28.2%, followed by those who are three to five years of work experience, 23%. Um, in terms of uh, what sort of hospitals do they work in, most of them were from uh, state, federal, and territory. Uh, so that's about 43%. Uh, For-profit hospital, 30%, and non-profit hospital, 17%. So are you ready for the dark side? So this is what we find, scarily. So high performance actually reduce job demand. Contributing to what I expect to see, more high performance, more uh, uh, job demand. Because uh, here we actually find that if your high performance work system is designed appropriately, it actually can reduce your feeling of job demands at work. So there's hope there. So HR director, take note. Um, so a high performance system reduces job demand, but it also gives you more job resources and gives you more uh, engagement. But what's scary in this model is that job demand leads to more engagement, which I was quite surprised because I didn't expect that. I would expect when you experience more job demand, your engagement is going to go down. But here we actually have a positive relationship there. Okay, maybe it's a part-time nurses thing where part-time nurses, uh, they don't experience as much of a job demand. And because they purposely chose to be a part-time worker, therefore it doesn't impact on their engagement that much. I don't know, that's, I'm still trying to understand that. But what's really bad is here. High performance work system leads to more burnout. So that's why I call the study, it's a dark side of high performance work system. So instead of uh, reducing your burnout, it actually increases. So it's all that competition and all that expectations of high performance that actually leads you to uh, a draining away your psychological resources where you're no longer engaged at work. It actually drains away that positive energy. I don't know, so that's study one. So let's look at study two. So study two, um, this one we've published in recently, uh, it's uh, looking at hospitality uh, workers. Um, so here again, we are using job demands resources model again, so I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, because you remember there'll be a quiz later on in five minutes time. And the aim of this study is to uh, now, we're trying to understand whether high performance work system enhance work engagement and the the, actually, it's not burnt out of hospitality workers, it's actually turnover intention. So now we're trying to see whether, you know, if you are burnt out, you want to uh, turn over from um, uh, being a hospitality workers. Um, so we all know hospitality workers, uh, those are the poor people who serve you at coffee shops, uh, taking your order, uh, having to address uh, you know, your demands as a passive aggressive customer. Sorry, I'm talking about myself. Um, or, 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 or even uh, people who are standing in a hotel, you know, um, um, 
you know, sort of taking orders from uh, uh, horrible hotel guests. Um, so the question here for the hospitality employees is uh, how do we go about uh, retaining them? Because, uh, you know, hotels and restaurants, they spend a lot of money, uh, you know, uh, recruiting those people. I usually have to train them, but they can't retain them. So uh, we, it, the question here is uh, what are some of the predictors of, uh, you know, trying to reduce turnover? But um, so for this study, we also use a, a, another theory, it's called uh, positive organizational support theory. So positive organizational support theory uh, says if organization can design a work environment that's a, a, about providing uh, positive support, uh, giving that, uh, uh, you know, managers who listen to you have a good relationship with you, that can actually enhance your employee retention, uh, which means you can also reduce uh, workplace bullying. As you all know, hotels experience a lot of workplace bullying. So this is a little model. Again, no statistics. Uh, it's only pictures. So what we're trying to argue is uh, if you have high performance work system, it's going to um, you know, sort of, uh, in reduce workplace bullying because uh, uh, contrary to uh, uh, research, we're saying that uh, people understand what is expected of them, then they don't feel that they've been bullied. You know, because there's clear job description as Nick was saying earlier, people understand what they have to do. Thanks for that, three minutes to go. So um, who are the participants here? Uh, more than half were female, again, because of the hospitality uh, sector. Uh, they were between 26 and 40 years old, and they tend to uh, work in organizations that's uh, quite small, 20 to 49 employees. So what do you find? Uh, there's some good things, there's some bad things. I thought the, the red circle uh, highlights what I want to show here. So if you have more high performance work system, there's more workplace bullying. So it's actually contra contradicting to what I expect to see. But more positive support in the organizations actually reduces workplace bullying. More workplace bullying reduces job satisfaction. More workplace bullying uh, enhances uh, intention to quit. So what's the morale of the story here? Workplace bullying is bad, but high performance work system has a dark side. It actually increases workplace bullying, contradicting to what I was expecting to see in the first place. So um, because it's three minutes, um, so I'm going to uh, uh, jump to uh, you know the, the the discussion and implications. So what does that all mean? What's the take home takeaway here? The takeaway here is that um, if you want to implement high performance work system, you need a supportive work environment. You need an organizations that create that environment for you, where you can talk to your managers, you can talk to your colleagues, and ask for help. Uh, you want to be able to have that. Uh, psychological resources as employees to be able to deal with uh, stress and uh, all the negative things at work, especially those who are under the pump because they have high workload and low resources. So uh, maybe one of the solution is to uh, focus on mindfulness uh, training. So maybe a bit of a mm, away on um, you know give you time to uh, meditate and also uh, other things such as uh, giving you more hope, resilience, optimism, and self-efficacy could buffer the negative side of a uh, high performance work system. Just so uh, you know, uh, this is my group, uh, Center for Work and Organizational Performance. You see some of the members around here tonight, so you can uh, have a chat to us later on. Thank you. Hey gang everyone, what a great privilege it is to be invited to come and speak tonight. Can I thank Mariam and, and Stephen for the opportunity. I will say it sucks being me going after the two of you. Uh, I don't have too many disclaimers tonight. Uh, my first disclaimer is I am not an academic. Um, I have never been cited, not even once. So I'm not going to compete with you any time. But you guys can change that tonight. It should be like hashtag, I don't know. We'll, we'll do like some virtual citing, I hope anyway but um, like uh, yeah so I'm really grateful uh, like I said we're really enjoying working with ECU it's an amazing university it's an amazing school of business and law uh, and like I said I appreciate the opportunity to come tonight 
Uh, the closest that I've come to academia is that I, in 2016 I finished my, my MBA. Uh, I won't mention the university because it should have been at ECU. But, uh, so we won't mention the, the other ones, hence why it's not even in my bio because it's not worth mentioning. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like I said, I, I've been extremely privileged in my career. It has been a bit of a kibitzer career. I probably am a bit of a kibitzer. Uh, I've got a background in accounting and finance, but I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to, do, uh, to lead a number of organisations. and. And uh, so tonight, uh, when I was uh, tasked with uh, putting something together on how to build a high performance culture in organisations, um, it, uh, I really spent the, probably the last couple of weeks uh, undertaking uh, like a self-reflective journey and can I say not only am I uh, grateful to be here but I'm actually really grateful because I got a lot out of it so because I didn't have any academic models or things to go to but so it, it caused me actually to reflect and I went back and I looked at the organisations I've led, the teams I've led and I've had some fantastic teams over the years but I've also had challenges as you do in, you know, in leadership roles if you didn't have challenges we wouldn't be needed as managers and so I went back over some of my uh, previous roles and I tried to go well mm, you know how, how, how would you go and do this and really my starting journey when I took that title um, my starting journey which was a question to myself really actually was well what does high performance culture actually look like mm -hmm. so if you're going to answer the question how do we build it I wanted to start off on the journey of actually going well what, what am I actually supposedly building uh, so my starting point was the end point. What does the end product look like? And what I was hoping to do tonight uh, is really two parts, is share with you the journey that I went through as far, from a reflection point of view of actually trying to ascertain what I believe you know, the end point looked like and then go back again and go, well, how do I believe we can build that all in less than 15 minutes. So, <laughs> you know, sure, <laughs> why not? Uh, I was saying to Mariam that she's very cruel making a former par Member of Parliament, you know, only speak for 15 minutes. That's normally how long it takes me to just talk about me, you know. And, uh, but anyway, so my, my starting point really was great. Uh, as a leader, you know, I've been asked or we should all aspire anyway to have a high performance culture. What does that look like? So then what I really decided in my own mind is going, well, uh, what does a fruit look like? And by that I mean, you know how people say, you know, look, look for the fruit. In other words, if I were to look at an organisation, if I went somewhere that uh, it was rec recommended to me, go and check out this organisation, they've got a high performance culture, what am I expecting to find? What are the, the traits or the qualities that I believe an organisation has? And again, remember the original disclaimer, these are my thoughts, so please don't have a crack at my thinking model. Um, <laughs> I believe that I would be looking for traits within a team or within an organisation or within a workplace that exhibited efficiency, quality, and then I put these two together, profitability and sustainability. Now again, I've got an accounting and finance background, I, I love looking at dollars and cents, but equally the sustainability was important as well. Number one, not everyone is in for profit, so you've got not-for-profit organisations, but as you'll see later, uh, sustainability, and this is where there definitely is linkages to what both uh, Nick and, and Stephen spoke about, includes the sustainability of your team and the sustainability of your, uh, your team to be able to do it. Uh, I'll play around with that in a minute, uh, but I really believed, I said, well, high performance by very definition means that you should be doing things as well as possibly, as efficiently as possible. So if you don't have that, I really thought, well, if, you don't, if you're not doing things efficiently, I don't know if I'd be calling you uh, high performance. Quality is subjective. You know, what's a quality toothpick versus what's a quality iPhone? But I still believe that if you're not producing quality that's relative to what you're organisation is there to do, be it a service or a product, again I question whether that, unless it, you know, I mean Ryanair uh, it might be a low cost model but there is still an element of quality in regard to how they deliver a low cost model. So my view was that if you don't have quality, I also personally would question whether I'd be willing to call myself high performance and again uh, without profitability and sustainability, uh, well it just wouldn't work. And so I, I tested it. Um, I said, well, what if I only have two? What if I've got efficiency and I've got profitability and sustainability? So I'm highly efficient at pumping something out, be it a product or a service, and I'm actually maintaining a profitable outcome in doing it. 
my view really was that I didn't believe that was going to be sustainable in the long term. I, in the short term, yes, because you're being profitable and you're being efficient. But the analogy that came to me in my mind is it's like a boiler room. Have anyone seen the movie, The Boiler Room? Yeah, that's cool little bit. You know, you are churning and burning. And for example, you know, I don't believe that the, uh, you know, the HR model that Nick was talking about would work in that. You know, that, that is just churn and burn. And I thought, well, without quality, I, I think that would struggle in the long run. What if you had something that was really good quality, product or service, and it was profitable and sustainable? So interestingly, out of all the three, you know, you can see where I'm going with this, uh, connotations, in theory, you could actually keep this going because you've got something of quality uh, and you know, so people are buying it, it's profitable and sustainable. But would I call it high performance? No, because you're actually inefficient. You'll, you'll keep going, but you're not being efficient. Why? You've left money on the table, for lack of a better term, because without efficiency, it means you could have done better. So you're doing okay. Um, the danger, of course, with that is that if you're inefficient and someone else comes along and is efficient, right, then your long-term sustainability could be impacted. So at the time, for the time being, you're profitable, you're sustainable, you've got quality. I'm going to grab a glass of water. Talk amongst yourselves, smoke if you've got them. <laughs> Then finally, no big surprise what the next one's going to be, is if you've got efficiency and you've got quality but you're not profitable or sustainable, it's a pretty obvious one. Now the question here is you're really efficient, you're very, very good at producing something and it's of a good quality. So what's the issue here? Either you're producing the wrong product or service, so now we're talking marketing 101, you know, you, you haven't, you're producing something that you want to produce that people don't want to buy. or they do want to buy it and you are producing a good quality of it and you're doing it as efficiently as you are capable or your organisation is capable of but you still can't compete. You're just being squeezed out. There's people out there that are bigger than you, more efficient than you, so despite the fact that you're doing the best you can and you're producing something of quality, you're not going to be sustainable. So, uh, so again, for me, as part of this process from the reflective journey, I thought, no, no, I would want to see efficiency quality, profitability together as trademarks. However, we know that those three traits don't live in a vacuum. And so it lives in an ecosystem. And if you're going to have fruit, you need the tree. I didn't want to bring the tree back again too many times. I thought, OK, you can. But the idea being is, that's all well and good. This, these are the traits. They're the, the outcomes that we want people to be able to identify within our organisation. But you've got the organisation, you've got the people, you've got the team that are going to make that work. And so in and amongst it as well, you've got the importance of team morale, team motivation, team stability, team dynamics. You take any of them out, or if they're underperforming, and I would argue some of those traits are going to suffer. If you've got, so by team dynamics, I mean having the right people in the right jobs. Um, I've gone through, uh, we uh, at my work and previous works, uh, we, we really love the HBDI model. I don't know if anyone's ever done the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. It's a, bit like, a little bit like DISC, but it's, no, I've lost you. Yeah, okay, never mind. But it, it basically looks at people's thinking styles. You know, are they analytical? Are they organised? Are they big picture? Are they visual? Or are they more, uh, you know, um, emotional? Like, you know, in, in touch, you know, with their emotions, people orientated. It's a really interesting exercise to do. And it, it says a lot sometimes about putting people in the right jobs. You put people where their strengths are going to excel. But if your team dynamics are wrong and you don't have the right people in the right role, you can't tell me that you're going to be a efficient or pumping out quality. Uh, if your team stability, so we're talking about turnover a lot before, you know, if you're churning and burning your staff, there's not, not only is there a cost involved with that, with constant staff turnover, but again, without team stability, I question how often you're going to be able to pump out the quality. You're not going to be as efficient. Uh, team motivation we'll talk about a little bit later. But again, same with a low morale team, I can't imagine uh, producing these. So really I thought, no, okay, that's what I'm looking for, that's what I'm aiming for, but it doesn't live in a vacuum. There's an overall ecosystem. Um, so it bring, brings us back to that. But I actually then thought there's still one thing missing. There's still one thing missing. Even if I had all that, I've got a motivated team, I've got the right people doing the right things, we're having a great time, we're displaying these things. <coughs> and for me, this was the final thing, and you know, for me the most important, you've actually got to be heading in the right direction. It's got to be a unity of purpose. 
And uh, otherwise, you're being really efficient, producing something of great quality and profitable, and you're really happy going down the wrong river. Um, so for me, this was then the end point that I arrived at, which was really to answer the original question in my mind, what does actually a high-performance culture look like? And for me, that was an organisation that is efficient, producing something of quality, it's profitable and sustainable, where there's a unity of purpose heading in the vision that that organisation has determined. We're halfway. Oh, dear. Oh, I'll go quick. Somewhere here. Sorry. Sure, sure. In Parliament, I'd say, Mr. Speaker, can I seek an extension? Anyway, no, I'll speed up. So that was, I suppose, probably the hardest bit for me, actually going, OK, that's what I want to achieve. Now, how do I achieve it? And we know that we're never going to go into massively deep detail tonight in a, in a short period of time. And I enjoyed this so much, I'm probably going to use this to spin off, you know, sub... Uh, sessions and whatnot for my own students and for my own staff. But if I'm going to build this, for me, I actually believe the starting point was the very last edition, which was actually the vision. Right? Probably not surprising. Right? I think you have to start off with the vision. And I saw that responsibility clearly sitting with the leader. That has to come from the leadership position. Right? The leader sets the vision. And I'm going to trademark that, if it hasn't already. You have to become a master caster. Right? You've got to be good at casting that vision and getting that to um, you know, set that scene. And uh, I believe there's really three uh, questions that you need to answer for your team. Where are we going? Why are we going there? And there's one more, which is on the next screen. We're going to work our way back, back to the tree now. What's in it for me? Really important. Don't miss that step. Really important. Tell your team where you're going, why you're going there, but what's in it for them. And it doesn't need to be money all the time. It's different. Everyone's different. It might be about the excitement of growing your business, the excitement of the, 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 the team taking on new responsibility, the fact that you might launch something on the East Coast. There might be some travelling. Different <coughs> people get motivated by different things. But the, like I said earlier, that was one part of four. You have to build your team. You've got to build the ecosystem. You've got to build the right team to get those traits that you <coughs> want. And now I believe your senior leadership team comes in. You're no longer having to do this solo. As a leader, you set the vision. But if you surround yourself with good leaders, and I'm blessed, I've got some amazing people as my right-hand men and women, and I've had that previously as well, because I can't do everything. You know, They will help you, so you get the right team with the right skill set, if you've got good leadership and good processes, I believe that helps with your team stability. Uh, and I believe if you've got the right team and the right leadership and the right value model, so we spoke earlier about valuing your staff and whatever that may look like, empowering your staff, I believe that will lead to good morale and you're going to have that fertile soil. Then I believe you can start working on what it means in your business to get those sort of quality outcomes. And now, actually, the team will help you achieve it. If you've built the right team, so you've set the vision, got a good leadership team around you, built the team around you, they will actually help you now, because now it is a team effort. And if we're looking at culture, the culture can't be a one-person thing. Then it's not a culture. Culture has to be, it has to be the organisation. And just very quickly, you know, broadly speaking, efficiency, you know, you'd be looking at good processes, cohesion, good planning, good communication. A, a culture of continuous improvement, willing to question the status quo, and embrace technology, embrace change. Quality, I'm, a, I'm big on quality, uh, very big on it. I believe it has to be a core value. It has to be backed up with high expectations. I always say to my team, we should strive for excellence, not for perfection. You'll never achieve perfection, you'll be frustrated. But you should strive for excellence. It should be non-negotiable. You shouldn't be able to trade it off in order to achieve one of these. You know, we normally do for quality, but this time round maybe we'll just skip it this time so that we can achieve that. It should be non-negotiable and it should be enterprise-wide. And finally, financial discipline, part of the vernacular, integral part of decision-making, and again, it's not all about dollars, it's that work-life balance. Otherwise, if you're profitable in the dollars and you've got great processes, good technology and you're good quality and you burn your team out, well, you're back to square one, you've missed it. Um, but again, again, coming from an accounting background, dollars and cents are important. You've got to, it's got to be sustainable. It's got to you know, have that outcome in mind. And that was my journey to what I believed, and I think I've got it just in the nick of time, that was my personal journey of uh, dissecting that topic and going, wow, and I really, really enjoyed it. 
that's my view on how I think you could build a high performance work culture. Any one of those you could split off and you know, go into phenomenal further detail. But just at a high level for me, uh, I thought I would leave that with you guys today in regard to how to achieve a high performance work culture. Thank you very much. alternatives, you did quite emphatically say that only the stabilisation model can, can promote sustainable careers, but uh, more self-managing. Can we do away with management? Can we do away with HR and still have sustainable careers? Okay, thank you. Uh, what do we do, the mechanics? Is it this or...? It's working. Yeah. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. This works. And I do come from an HR background myself, so I've heard. Uh, I'm not, uh, actually the idea of sustainable careers comes from the Netherlands. Netherlands, if you see the names there, basically they are uh, Dutch and uh, Belgian names. Um, I'm not familiar with, uh, with uh, this model in this organization, but actually there is no, uh, I don't think there is any discrepancy between the two. Uh, sustainable, uh, basically stabilization model means what? Means that actually we offer meaningful jobs, we see things in the long term, uh, we, uh, we do multi-skilling uh, and uh, we, we, have, uh, we offer opportunities to each other uh, and we learn uh, so we are able to adapt and uh, to progress. So I don't think there is any discrepancy between this. Uh, I'm not familiar with, uh, with this model but I don't see discrepancy. If this model was, we had uh, a situation where uh, people were working as part-timers and they would hire people in and out of the organization uh, in a self-managed team and they were able to sustain it, which would be very difficult, this is my view, then we would talk about a discrepancy. But actually, the way you describe it, uh, it seems that it fits very well the stabilization model. Uh, in fact, very much in, uh, in Southwestern Lines, in the model of Southwestern Lines, if you, if you read a little bit, it's about teamwork. Not much about supervision. Basically, people work as a team and they feel as a team and they feel uh, as a whole in the whole organization. Um, so this is my, my response. That's the best I can do. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Dr. Brian Handley, uh, Sessional uh, Academic with ECU. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your presentation. I enjoyed it uh, enormously. Uh, my question is to the whole panel. Um, a recent McKinsey report talked about the problems associated with disruptive technology and the trillions of dollars by 2020. Um, I'm a marketer by discipline. And the issue will be, for example, that uh, McDonald's in the United States of America are now uh, providing robots to make hamburgers in terms of differentiation. Um, it's not only just only in Ballerine, but uh, there's a barista in Sydney that is also a robot. And um, we have significant amounts of technology. Can you, as a panel, just uh, describe your views, how uh, that technology will uh, impact your areas? Thank you. Oh gosh! Thanks. 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 I, I see you as, as, as the most knowledgeable here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, disruptive technologies, and I mean, one of the points that I put in there was the, the fact that we have to embrace technology to the point where I think it's unavoidable. Um, and you, you know, uh, I don't want to mention the organisation name because I don't, you know, one of the organisations that I worked at uh, had plateaued. And for me in business, even plateau is as good as decline. It's just a tiny little bit slower initially. And um, because eventually your competitors will just keep growing. And if you plateau, you'll just be left behind. You won't feel it straight away because if you plateau in a profitable plane, you'll be profitable, profitable until you wake up one day and you find you're not actually competitive anymore because you've been left behind. And the danger with technology is that if you don't expect the fact that it will have an impact, then it's almost the same as plateauing in, the, in that space. Richard's Mining Services that I worked at, uh, we uh, did dump truck training, and amongst other things, so we trained dump truck drivers. 
And I was telling the directors for many years, you know, we've got to be careful, automation is coming. And I mean, you see it again in, in, the, uh, in the business news today about Rio Tinto doing the first delivery of iron ore on their automated train. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, but there will be a time where you won't need dump truck drivers, you know. And within the mining space, you could argue that is at the slightly lower end of the, you know, skills development gap. So we, we, we are moving more into a knowledge economy and it is a challenge. Our challenge will be to bring our entire society along with us and so that we can, you know, even at the AMA, now I'm not a doctor, but you know, there's surgeries now that can be yes. uh, undertaken by robots. So it would be a little bit naive to go, oh, it's only going to impact the baristas and, and whatnot. I mean, uh, hospital pharmacies now, you know, robot uh, pick and packing and, and warehouses it is you know, where it is, hence why, putting my polit political hat on, we've got to be so focused on STEAM. Now, I say STEAM, not yeah. STEM, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, uh, and Australia has a challenge there. We, uh, we continue to lag behind the rest of the world in regard to some of our outputs that are from a high school level. We, we really need to address that so that we're having creative, entrepreneurial at that advanced curve. Uh, we need, and that should translate into something of quality. But again, quality is a broad, broad term. You know, but something where there is a demand, it's good, it's new to the market, we can be efficient so that we can compete and then we can be sustainable. Could I just add, at the risk of monopolising the conversation, could I just add one more thing to that, please? And radiology for mammograms is now being done by computers and it is the surgeon that makes the final decision yeah. where it goes, uh, goes yeah. through all of those. And uh, I think we, um, we are going to, from your uh, background as a parliamentarian, um, we hear daily uh, current Prime Minister saying three jobs here, five jobs there. I think there's going to be a decimation of jobs. And I think the topics of universal salary and uh, problems associated with unemployed youth and groups is going to be significant yeah. in, in our workplace. So, without, again, without monopolising, I'm going to give a plug to ECU. Uh, uh, but, you know, one of the reasons why the AMA, uh, and there's many reasons, because why would you not want to work with Mariam and her team, but one of the reasons why we uh, chose to go with ECU is because the one word that kept coming to my mind to uh, describe ECU, which is not, I think, a common trait amongst universities, is agility. And, uh, the, you know, and we've got to be really careful because, like you said, gone are the days where you study one field of something and then you do it for 20 or 30 or 40 years, you know, if we're going to have these multiple job changes and to a degree that's where vocational education should have its role, we've got a bit of an issue at the moment where we need to be overcoming some, some bad reputational issues of the Careers Australia side of things and whatnot. But the, the training and the retraining of ourselves and the perpetual learning is absolutely critical that the day we stop learning we're going to be stuffed but you know we need to be able to respond to a changing uh, economy and a changing marketplace quicker you know we can't so the sandstone universities god bless them you know i think some of their challenges will be that they they need to be able to adapt and and uh, uh, to the demands quicker thank you Oh, yes, yeah. 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 Thank you, Thank you. Hey, uh, my name's Andy. Sorry, it's really loud. Um, <laughs> I'm just here because I'm honestly really passionate about performance in business and effective management leadership. And it's just been one thing that I've just, I don't know, I've really kind of enjoyed growing up. And so my question was for uh, Professor Tio. And uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no. um, I've been reading the book called Scrum. And I've been really, really fascinated about that whole kind of managerial practice and how it gets put into play. And just on your points about burnout, I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of that kind of, you know, like management plan in terms of like how employees, would they get burnt out or you know, do you reckon they'd get burnt out quicker, quicker or less quick? I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, obviously, as someone who's very interested in employee well-being, I think um, you know uh, the the whole idea of uh, putting employees through that sort of very intense work environment. You're going to be getting some negative outcomes coming out from there. Uh, but 
at the end of the day, I think it's like what Jan was saying, you know, leadership really matters. If your organization's leadership team is not there leading the way, creating that value, uh, you know, in, the, in terms of the three uh, metaphor, I really like that in, in the sense that I think if this organization doesn't commit to its employees, so now we're not talking about employees committing to the organization, okay? That's managerial mumbo jumbo. We're talking about organization actually caring for the employees. If you don't get that care, no matter what sort of high performance you're going to put into, it's going to like what my uh, nursing study is going to find. You're going to get more burnout because you need that care to be there to show to your employees that there's respect, that two-way respect, the expectations is there, so that you will be willing to, un like you say, understanding what's in it for me in order to uh, come for the ride. You know, so getting onto that bus is really important. You know, like my colleague on telling me three minutes, so I can't speak too long to you. But uh, yeah, so I, I think that whole idea of care, respect, uh, and also uh, commitment to employees' well-being and welfare is critical. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm happy for somebody else to ask a question if they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I just say thank you so much to the three of you. You are amazing. Um, three very different presentations and amazing. Um, one of the things that's very close to my heart is cross-cultural management, both in terms of research but also practice, because we have a very, very diverse school and the School of Business and Law. Um, I want to ask you about cultural context, and I'm happy for whom I am. All three of you are very international in your backgrounds as well. Um, does national culture come into this? And if so, how or why or where? So, thank you. Uh, okay, so, well, it, sorry, I'll just. Do you want to go first? You're the highest ranking. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I suppose in short, humbly, I would say absolutely, because, you know, um, uh, I'm reading a book at the moment called uh, Cultural Intelligence, and mm. this notion about we've got IQ and we've been talking about EQ for a while, but really this notion about there being CQ as well, because not all cultures are the same. And you know, we talk about individualistic versus, you know, a high power separation, low power separation. and. I think that has an impact on an organisation. One of the dangers that we keep hearing is that people who have a great business model that works here, they think they can just up and transplant it. And perhaps mm. one of the most you know, tricky moves any organisation will ever do is actually move beyond its national boundaries. Um, and so I think you know, many of the you know, notions still hold true, but the execution of them um, and you know, it comes back to the the ecosystem changes. When you go into a different cultural setting, it's a different ecosystem. The under, we're all human. The underlying things are the same, but how we do things and how we look after and how we nurture that will be different, in my humble opinion. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is correct. I mean, um, Professor Omari and Mariam, uh, who are doing a little bit work together, she knows that there are differences between cultures, for example, in performance orientation. Mm. So particular models and how we're going to talk about performance and what is performance and pressure, and how much pressure people from different cultures can take, differs a lot. And of course, as we, as, as we know with Mariam, this also influences factors like bullying. Mm -hmm. Uh, Etc. Not uh, by me. Uh, no, no, <laughs> not by you at all. But by influence, for example, we have found that in cultures with uh, higher performance orientation, bullying at work is more acceptable, provided that it is done under the under the idea that it's going to improve performance. Just to give you, so there are there are many differences. On the other hand, uh, there are also differences not only in culture, uh, but also in legislation. Uh, this is also very important. For instance, uh, you can operate very differently in the United States, very differently in China, very differently in Germany. Mm. It's also an issue. Uh, on the other hand, we also have to think that more and more, I think this is a fact, we are becoming globally more aligned. Uh, there is more, we are becoming more and more similar gradually. 